thank you very much, and thank you very much to UNESCO and to the organizers for associating CERN with this inaugural International Day of, uh, of Light. It is a great pleasure to be able to speak about CERN here at UNESCO, because as we already heard earlier today, CERN and UNESCO share a unique bond. Uh, UNESCO was part of the creation of CERN and was there from the very beginning. The initial idea and the concept of CERN came about at a conference in Florence in 1950, and CERN was then created as a concept in 1951 and then came into being in 1954 as an intergovernmental organization. This was already mentioned earlier today. So today, building on that and that spirit of collaboration that UNESCO brought to us from the beginning, CERN is now the world's biggest laboratory for particle physics, straddling the border between France and Switzerland just outside of Geneva. And our goal is to understand the most fundamental particles and laws of the universe. Now, we have a threefold mission. First is to um, to perform world-class research in fundamental physics. In order to do that, we need to develop cutting-edge technologies to answer the big questions in physics. And what enables this to happen is exactly international collaboration, bringing people together from across the world to perform the most advanced uh, science in the world. Now, what do we do? We ask the big question, what are we made of? We study the elementary building blocks of matter and the forces that control their behavior. We've already had some very impressive talks about the Big Bang and the origins of the universe today, so I'm very lucky that I don't have to go into detail on that. But this is just to put in perspective what is it that we're actually doing. Now, there are four pillars, if you will, that underpin the efforts to find answers to that big question. First of all, of course, research, science, that is what we do. Innovation, the technology development that we create. Education and training is very important. We really train the next generation of scientists, of engineers and technicians. And then collaboration. This is really the glue that brings all of this together and holds everything together. And this is what is the CERN model. So what is actually the CERN model of collaboration. Now, we were founded in 1954, based on these discussions in UNESCO at the time, under the banner of Science for Peace. Now, today we have 22 member states. We have eight associate member states. Three of those are in what's called the pre-stage to membership, so they will be, coming, will be becoming members within the next three to five years, so we will be growing to, to uh, 25 members uh, shortly. In addition to that, we have three observers to our council. So again, a very important, a very important partners. These are countries that have made very important contributions to the infrastructure over the years. In addition to that, we have 50 odd countries that we have international collaboration agreements with, which gives us a very dense network of institutional relations with countries across the world. Now, if we try and unpack this a little bit more, this is the institutional level of CERN, but the most impressive part is the user community that we host. This is a community of more than 13,000 scientists from across the world. Now, the largest community is from our member states. This is not surprising, but we have a growing community from our associate member states also as their particle phys physics communities develop and grow and get bigger. We have many from our servers. This is Japan, Russia, and the US. Very big communities there. And then a very important portion from other countries. And it's very interesting to look at that in a little bit more detail. So that brings us to a community of over 17,500 people working together, representing more than 110 nationalities. Now, this becomes even more impressive when you look at the spread of this and how it's becoming increasingly global. You will see on this map, this is based on the institutes from which our users are coming, that you will see many areas represented in which you would not necessarily, that you would not necessarily associate with fundamental research and basic research. But it's very important that there's a lot of growth and there's a lot of dynamism in many regions of the world, which is very uh, impressive and I think a very important signal for the future for all of us. Now, 
So is this collaboration at an institutional level between countries, at the scientific level between universities and scientists that underpin everything that CERN does, whether it's to do with, with the, uh, the theoretical and the experimental physics, with our accelerators, and with also computing, which is again also an international effort. As we already heard, CERN has served as a model for others uh, and also allows us to partner with a number of entities. We host at CERN the IT infrastructure for UNOSAT, which is a satellite analysis mechanism under the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITA, which is based in Geneva. They provide satellite images for the UN family and for other humanitarian partners. As we've already heard, CERN has inspired, the CERN model has inspired SESAMI. I think now we could hear with all that we've heard from the beautiful talk also from Jihan earlier, that we are now in turn being inspired very much by what's happening in SESAMI. And I think we can all really take hope and take, uh, take great uh, pride in what they have done. And I think we will continue to follow them with, uh, with great interest. CERN now has observer status, as you also saw in the previous talks, with the SESAMI Council, because we really feel a strong and will continue to support as much as we can. And of course, the CERN model of community building, of consensus building, and the collaborative approach inspires in many, many other fields um, and is also studied as a, as a model for governance and for policy making in various areas. We heard already a little bit about the sustainable development goals and the opportunities that that opens up. So Peter Glockman spoke about how this uh, provides some challenges for the science community, but also a number of entry points, and probably is now a platform where scientists can look at new ways of engaging with policymakers, and policymakers also have opportunities to really draw evidence for policymaking. And CERN has identified uh, five sustainable development goals where we are de facto already contributing, and this is an important framework for us, and we're working with our member states to see how CERN can contribute even further in that area. So I just want to conclude with just a couple of, of reflections on what is the value of global science cooperation, because I think it's, it's easy both to underestimate, just as it's possible, to overestimate what that actually means and what's the impact. And I think on a symbolic level, science collaboration shows us what's possible when we put aside our differences and we allow ourselves to work together towards common goals. And I think we need those symbols in the world. We saw that with Sesame. It is a powerful symbol. But on a practical level, it also allows people to come together and do practical work. And this is how you learn. This is how you foster respect. And this is how you foster understanding. And then we must also not overestimate what science can do, because it's clear that science cannot solve geopolitical crisis, but it can show a way forward and it can provide a practical platform for people to work together. And this is really what is the foundation of peace and sustainable development. And I think that is really where we can see the value of science. Thank you. <laughs>